The Lord be with you. The passion of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to John. Jesus went out with his disciples across the Kidron Valley to to where there was a garden into which he and his disciples entered. Judas, his betrayer, also knew the place because Jesus had often met there with his disciples. So Judas got a band of soldiers and guards from the chief priests and the Pharisees and went there with lanterns, torches, and weapons. Jesus, knowing everything that was going to happen to him, went out and said to them, Whom are you looking for? They answered him, Jesus the Nazarene. He said to them, I am. Judas, his betrayer, was also with them. When he said to them, I am, they turned away and fell to the ground. So he again asked them, Whom are you looking for? They said, Jesus the Nazarene. Jesus answered, I told you that I am. So if you are looking for me, let these men go. This was to fulfill what he had said. I have not lost any of those you gave me. Then Simon Peter, who had a sword, drew it, struck the high priest's slave, and cut off his right ear. The slave's name was Malchus. Jesus said to Peter, Put your sword into its scabbard. Shall I not drink the cup that the Father gave me? So the band of soldiers, the tribune, and the Jewish guards seized Jesus, bound him, and brought him to Annas first. He was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, who was high priest that year. It was Caiaphas who had counseled the Jews that it was better that one man die rather than the people. Simon Peter and another disciple followed Jesus. Now the other disciple, who was known to the high priest, and he entered the courtyard of the high priest with Jesus. But Peter stood at the gate outside. So the other disciple, The acquaintance of the high priest went out and spoke to the gatekeeper and brought Peter in. Then the maid, who was the gatekeeper, said to Peter, You are not one of this man's disciples, are you? He said, I am not. Now the slaves and the guards were standing around a charcoal fire that that they had made because it was cold and were warming themselves. Peter was also standing there, keeping warm. The high priest questioned Jesus about his disciples and about his doctrine. Jesus answered him, I have spoken publicly to the world. I have always taught in a synagogue or in the temple area where all the Jews gather, and in secret I have said nothing. Why ask me? Ask those who heard me what I said to them. They know what I said. When he had said this, one of the temple guards standing there struck Jesus and said, Is this the way you answer the high priest? Jesus answered him, If I have spoken wrongly, testify to the wrong. But if I have spoken rightly, why do you strike me? Then Annas sent him bound to Caiaphas, the high priest. Now Simon Peter was standing there keeping warm, and they said to him, You are not one of his disciples, are you? He denied it and said, I am not. One of the slaves of the high priest, a relative of the one whose ear Peter had cut off, said, Didn't I see you in the garden with him? Again, Peter denied it. And immediately the cock crowed. Then they brought Jesus from Caiaphas to the praetorium. It was morning. And they themselves did not enter the praetorium in order not to be defiled so that they could eat the Passover. So Pilate came out to them and said, What charge do you bring against this man? They answered and said to him, If he were not a criminal, we would not have handed him over to you. 
At this, Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and judge him according to your law. The Jews answered him, We do not have the right to execute anyone. In order that the word of Jesus might be fulfilled, that he said, indicating the kind of death he would die. So Pilate went back into the praetorium and summoned Jesus and said to him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, Do you say this on your own, or have others told you about me? Pilate answered, I am not a Jew, am I? Your own nation and chief priests have handed you over to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, My kingdom does not belong to this world. If my kingdom did belong to this world, my attendants would be fighting to keep me from being handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not here. So Pilate said to him, Then you are a king? Jesus answered, You say, I am a king. For this I was born, and for this I came into the world to testify to the truth. Everyone who belongs to the truth listens to my voice. Pilate said to him, What is truth? When he had said this, he again went out to the Jews and said to them, I find no guilt in him, but you have a custom that I release one prisoner to you at Passover. Do you want me to release to you the king of the Jews? They cried out again, No, not this one, but Barabbas. Now Barabbas was a revolutionary. Then Pilate took Jesus and had him scourged, and the soldiers wove a crown of thorns and placed it on his head and clothed him in a purple cloak, and they came to him and said, Hail, King of the Jews! And they struck him repeatedly. Once more, Pilate went out and said to them, Look, I am bringing him out to you, so that you may know that I find no guilt in him. So Jesus came out, wearing the crown of thorns and the purple cloak, and he said to them, Behold, the man! When the chief priests and the guards saw him, they cried out, Crucify him! Crucify him! Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and crucify him. I find no guilt in him. The Jews answered, We have a law, and according to that law he ought to die, because he made himself the Son of God. Now when Pilate heard this statement, he became even more afraid, and went back into the praetorium and said to Jesus, where are you from? Jesus did not answer him. So Pilate said to him, Do you not speak to me? Do you not know that I have the power to release you and I have the power to crucify you? Jesus answered him, You would have no power over me if it had not been given to you from above. For this reason, the one who handed me over to you has the greater sin. Consequently, Pilate tried to release him, but the Jews cried out, If you release him, you are not a friend of Caesar. Everyone who makes himself a king opposes Caesar. When Pilate heard these words, he brought Jesus out and seated him on the judge's bench in the place called Stone Pavement, in Hebrew, Gabbatha. It was preparation day for Passover, and it was about noon. And he said to the Jews, Behold, your king! They cried out, Take him away! Take him away! Crucify him! Pilate said to them, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priests answered, We have no king but Caesar. Then he handed him over to them to be crucified. So they took Jesus and, carrying the cross himself, he went out to what is called the place of the skull, in Hebrew, Golgotha. There they crucified him, and with him two others, one on either side, with Jesus in the middle. Pilate also had an inscription written and put it on the cross. It read, Jesus the Nazarene, the King of the Jews. Now many of the Jews read this inscription, because the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and it was written in Hebrew, 
Latin, and Greek. So the chief priests of the Jews said to Pilate, Do not write the king of the Jews, but that he said, I am the king of the Jews. Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. When the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they took his clothes and divided them into four shares, a share for each soldier. They also took his tunic, but the tunic was seamless, woven in one piece from the top down. So they said to one another, Let's not tear it, but cast lots for it to see whose it will be. In order that the passage of scripture might be fulfilled that says, They divided my garments among them, and for my vesture they cast lots. This is what the soldiers did. Standing by the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary of Magdala. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple there whom he loved, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. Then he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her into his home. After this, aware that everything was now finished, in order that the scripture might be fulfilled, Jesus said, I thirst. There was a vessel filled with common wine. So they put a sponge soaked in wine on a sprig of hyssop and put it up to his mouth. When Jesus had taken the wine, he said, It is finished. And bowing his head, he handed over the spirit. Now, since it was preparation day, in order that the bodies might not remain on the cross on the Sabbath, for the Sabbath day of that week was a solemn one, the Jews asked Pilate that their legs be broken and that they be taken down. So the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and then of the other one who was crucified with Jesus. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. But one soldier thrust his lance into his side, and immediately blood and water flowed out. An eyewitness has testified, and his testimony is true. He knows that his, he is speaking the truth, so that you also may come to believe. For this happened so that the scripture passage might be fulfilled. Not a bone of it will be broken. And again, another passage says, They will look upon him whom they have pierced. After this, Joseph of Arimathea, secretly a disciple of Jesus for fear of the Jews, asked Pilate if he could remove the body of Jesus. And Pilate permitted it. So he came and took his body. Nicodemus, the one who had first come to him at night, also came bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes weighing about 100 pounds. They took the body of Jesus and bound it with burial cloths along with the spices, according to the Jewish burial custom. Now in the place where he had been crucified, there was a garden and in the garden a new tomb in which no one had yet been buried. So they laid Jesus there because of the Jewish preparation day, for the tomb was close by. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. What is this? that we are doing today on Good Friday. This is not a Mass. We did not start as a Mass would start. 
We will have no consecration of the Eucharist, although we will distribute Holy Communion. We will not end this with the typical closing of a Mass, a sign of the cross, and a blessing to go forth. What is the Good Friday service? It is, above all, an act of devotion. It is, above all, a prayer of great love for our Lord who died to save us. This is why we not only read the entire Passion from St. John's Gospel, but also in just a few moments, after we have done the ten great intercessions that go all the way back to the first centuries of the Church, we have this most extraordinary act of devotion, the veneration of the cross. And as I have said over and over over these past years, and perhaps you're tired of me hearing it, this is an act of tenderness and devotion. It is an act in which we kiss the cross. Yes, kiss the cross. Not simply touch it. Don't be afraid of the germs. Don't be afraid of the one who coughed before you. Kiss the cross. Because this is a service of devotion. But today I wish to speak in a more particular way. And for us to know what do I make of this, we must know what devotion means. Devotion comes from the same word for voting or votive. It's a word of dedication, of consecration. When we are devoted to someone, we give ourselves to them. Any of us, husbands and wives, any of us, mothers and fathers, we know that devotion is more than just doing what we ought to do, although indeed we have duties as parents and as spouses. Devotion takes it one step further and says that I give myself over to you, my beloved. This is why we don't shake hands with the cross. This is why, yes, I've become so upset that beginning about 20 years ago, for who knows what reason, some high-promoting expert said, you don't have to kiss the cross on Good Friday. Just touch it or bow. Well, we're not going to send you to jail for not kissing the cross. But kiss the cross. And I know that you would say good night to your spouse or your children and shake their hands. Today, is an act of devotion. But I wish to speak in a particular way this Good Friday. And I hope you won't mind if in a particular way I speak to a particular group here at this service today. I wish to speak to the mothers and to the grandmothers. And I wish to speak about the women of the eighth station of the cross. We know that as we reach that eighth station among the fourteenth stations, Jesus encounters a group of women who are weeping and mourning as they behold his suffering. And in that moment, in the eighth station of the cross, our Lord turns to those women and says, Daughters of Jerusalem, Weep not for me, but weep for yourselves and for your children. And down through the centuries, this has been a reminder, and again with no respect to the men here, but there is nobody 
who understands devotion like a mother. Of all the beautiful hymns that we sing on Good Friday, there is that ancient chant, Stabat Mater, and the first line typically translated, By the cross, her station keeping, the Blessed Mother, devoted to her son Jesus on the cross, when all the other tough guys ran off, save just a few, there was the Blessed Mother, and why was the Blessed Mother there? Of course, because she was his mother. And nobody, no one could possibly care what tenderness and piety and pain, the sorrow and death of her son. And as a priest, hearing confessions and in everyday conversations, over and over again I have heard the cries of mothers saying, Father, my children are in trouble. I have a grandchild who is in difficult straits. I raised, we tried to raise our children as Catholics, but none of them go to church now. Father, Father, what did we do wrong? What should we do? There is no one who cares about their children like a mother. And so months ago, a wonderful member of this parish said to me, Father, could we have a ministry, a movement, especially for mothers and grandmothers who are praying and praying some more for their children. And yes, some of those children are in very big trouble. They're in jail. They're addicted to drugs. Their lives are terribly, tragically broken. But I have also learned as a priest that there are families which look so golden from the outside, full of smiles and successes, and yet at the end of that day, the mother weeps. Why does she weep? Because those children, perhaps so successful, have wandered from the faith. Perhaps they've wandered down to some other church with the tambourines and the hoopla. Perhaps they've wandered completely away from religion of any kind. And perhaps underneath all the smiles and perfect teeth and beautiful careers, Jesus is not there. And that mother Perhaps that mother with not a whit of theological education believes that there is nothing as important as heaven and that who goes to heaven? Those who follow Jesus Christ. Those who receive the bread of life, the Eucharist at Mass. And underneath all those smiles, there are tears at the end of the day. Because that mother wants to be with her family forever in heaven. Weep not for me. Weep for yourselves and for your children. Today, on Good Friday at Transfiguration Parish, as we establish this beautiful movement for women of the Eighth Station, we declare it is not only okay, but it is a seemly and magnificent thing to do to weep for your children and your grandchildren and to cry them back to Christ, to pray for them 
all the way to heaven. I'm sure none of us are surprised that we've chosen as patroness for this beautiful movement of mothers and grandmothers, St. Monica, St. Monica, who centuries and centuries ago prayed and cried, prayed and cried some more for years till her son Augustine, wild and dissolute Augustine, returned to faith, returned to God. I hope some of you saw these beautiful little cards. They're out by the door. If you did not pick them up, please pick them up as you leave. It shows at the top the eighth station, our Lord speaking to the weeping women of Jerusalem. It shows St. Monica with her son being converted, now joined with her in faith. And it includes a beautiful prayer that I hope every mother and every grandmother and yes, every dad and granddad will pray. It says, St. Monica, exemplary mother of St. Augustine, you perseveringly pursued your wayward son, not with wild threats, but with prayerful cries to heaven. Intercede for all mothers in our day so that they may learn to draw their children to God. Teach them how to remain close to their children, even the prodigal sons and daughters who have sadly gone astray. Amen. Today, on this Good Friday, on this Feast of Devotion, as you come forward to kiss the cross of Jesus Christ, bring to that cross today your children and your grandchildren, especially those in most need of his mercy. My father told me years ago, he said, every mother is thinking about which child she has that is in the most trouble. That is true. That is so true. Bring that child today. Bring that grandchild today to the cross of Jesus Christ. And I don't think he'll mind at all if you bring five or ten or fifteen of them. But let us never be ashamed to cry as St. Monica did, to weep and to pray. Because it has been said before, grief is the price we pay for love. And stop pretending that all your children are golden, all your grandchildren are absolutely perfect. Stop that. That is no service to them. Let us instead, with prayers and with tears, bring our loved ones to God and offer to them to God. And I tell you, as a priest who has heard these prayers and has heard the answers to these prayers, there are mothers and grandmothers sitting in this church who can testify that their wayward children returned, that their prodigal sons and daughters returned. Don't give up. Keep praying, keep weeping, and keep devoting those children to God. Give them to God and to our Blessed Mother, because our Blessed Mother does not lightly let go of her children. They are not just your children. They are her children as well. And she will never, ever give up. Today, let us give our children to God, to his blessed mother, to their guardian angels, and to the saints. And I guarantee you, as we return one year from now, again for the Good Friday service, 
we will have testimony that the Lord did not give up, that the Blessed Mother did not give up, and that those sons and daughters are coming back home.